And I think with something like an app, there's a million of them out there. Zillow went from, it could have been an app where you just did a mortgage application to something that you're engaging with day to day just because it's interesting to you. What's going on, Liz? Hi, Joel. Nice to meet you. I love your last name. Your last name is the city I live in. So I assume that your family built the city. There's a city. There's a Cunningham city. I live in Cunningham, Tennessee, my friend. That's where I'm calling from right now. No way. I need to I need to go there. There's a lot of farmland. (laughs) (laughs) That's what you'll see. But we're only about an hour away from Nashville. So there's some fun stuff to do. Nice. Um, Very nice. Yeah. And so you're out in Dallas? Mm -hmm. Yeah, based in Dallas right now. So were you were you born and raised in Dallas or no? No, I'm a, I'm a San Diegan, true and true. Okay, all right. How yeah. did you make your way out to Dallas? Uh, with AMN, actually, I've I've uh, I've been with AMN for almost eleven years coming up. So I've you know moved around. Um, yeah, so I'm out here from AM for AMN, for AMN. We used to have our headquarters in San Diego, so it was a nice transition. Did you start in? digital transformation, technology leadership there? Or did you work your way up over the 11 years? Yeah. So it was funny. I was, um, you know, kind of prepping for our conversation. And and one of the things I was a little nervous about was, you know, hey, I, I'm kind of a, a tech fraud. Well, not really a fraud, but I'm not a technologist <laughs> by nature. Um, so, you know, I, I actually am a sociologist out of, out of uh, college and um, got into AMN uh, in marketing, kind of got my foot in the door. So, I, I came out of college during the recession, so there wasn't like a lot of stuff available, right? I, I worked for my dad for a couple of years and then in a nonprofit for a little bit, and I just wanted to get my foot in the door with a big company. So I started as like a low-level marketing specialist um, about 11 years ago and have just kind of worked my way into operations and then from operations into technology and then from technology, you know, into kind of the digital transformation space. So um, not necessarily a straight path one way, but a, a crooked path that got me to where I wanted to be eventually. I love it. It's almost always that way, right? right? And I'm curious to know, like, all right, so you join low-level marketing, you end up making your way to the top of the technology side of the business. Obviously, you had to figure out, and you have a huge, you have a professional background in sociology, so understanding people. <laughs> how did applying that, or how did you go about building relationships and becoming useful to people and identifying these opportunities so you could make your way up. Yeah, I think I think it's interesting that you said becoming useful because that's what I would say. You know, it, it's funny. I feel like sometimes, you know, uh, people think that you always just deserve a seat at the table, right? Because you have a certain title, a certain role, you just get a seat at the table. And I, I look at it a little differently of, you know, if you provide value and use to internal stakeholders, they invite you and they want you in the conversation. So, um, you know, when I started, I really just started diving in where help was needed most and where the biggest problems were. Um, and, you know, was always curious, always asking, you know, hey, can you show me this? Or, hey, I heard you have this problem. Can you sit me down? Show me what you're doing, sitting with a recruiter or someone in finance or someone in operations and just understanding. Um, so I think just gaining knowledge and being useful just kind of kept me growing. And then, you know, I know it's a little bit of cliche, but you say, you know, get your internal board of directors. I just made a really good network of leaders around AMN that were interested in my career growth and and gave me opportunities that probably wouldn't get if I was applying for them externally. Um, And I was able to take them and and run with them and just continue to grow that way. So, um, you know, you just got to add value, add value and learn. And are you currently leading a team? Yeah, I have about um, right now about 150 people on my team. Um, and we span across, uh, product management, product development, UX, digital marketing, and actually, um, kind of customer support, customer experience also falls underneath there. So we really kind of have a a good handle on making sure we've got a seamless digital experience from anywhere from, you know, support with an issue to finding a job, contacting a recruiter is all kind of under one roof with my team right now. Oh, that's interesting. So you're handling the the entire life cycle of the customer's digital experience interaction with AMN Healthcare. Yep. Yep. That sounds like a pretty fun job. It is It is fun because you get to, you know, experiment with new technology and new ideas, but then you also get to operationalize something that's real to your customers um, with, you know, customer support and how the business operates there. 
Um, so it's been it's been an an interesting an interesting journey, and I think you know back to the whole sociology thing, you know, having that kind of empathy for the customer and having my entire team being driven to be completely clinician centric and and thinking about what are the pain points of our users, how are we solving them digitally, how are we removing barriers for them? It, it's you know it's a really good synergy where we can get some some pretty awesome work done pretty quickly. And so when you're running this team of 150 people, obviously you understand this concept of how you were able to grow and become valuable and useful. So you're, you can correct me if I'm wrong, make a sumptive statement. So you, you would be looking for that in your next generation of, of leaders within that 150 pool. That's great. But can you influence and encourage it or no? Do you just sit back and watch it emerge from there and then invest in those people? Meaning like their talent? Yeah, like if you're looking, because you have to raise up the next generation, right? In your position, you have to always be looking for the the next leaders within that group set. Is there anything you can do to encourage that? Or does it just naturally emerge and you see the people doing it and then you just decide to invest in them for the people who are doing it? Yeah, so um, I have a couple of different ways that I that I approach that with my team. I'm, I'm very honest and transparent with my team where, you know, I, I tell them if you don't raise your hand for something like does it mean that someone's thinking about you for that next role? So if you're curious or you want to learn something else, you always need to be asking. So first, I, I kind of put a little bit of onus on them to to raise their hand when they're when they're bored, when they want to do something else. I always tell them, if there's one day that you wake up and you're bored and you're watching the clock, call me immediately because I will give you something else to do. So there's kind of that drive that I'm trying to push on them. But then on the flip side, you know, if I see some potential or I see someone that I think has opportunity to learn in a different area that's maybe not their area of expertise, I'll just put them on an initiative. So our team really works in like more hybrid pods where I don't care if your, you know, specification for your role is say SEO, if you're on a digital marketing team, like I'll go put you on a product team for a quarter, see how you like it, see if that expands your horizon. So, um, it's interesting. Like a lot of my product leaders, um, one of the guys, he was a reporting analyst that I hired, you know, for what what I was running operations a couple of jobs ago that was just so smart and, you know, had a lot of different talents. And I asked him one day, do you want to do product management? He's like, I guess I'll try it. And, you know, jumped over, started from the bottom there and is now a manager. Um, you know, I've got someone who was from learning and talent development. She was a trainer and I just thought she was so smart and just so good at solving problems and connecting dots. I, I brought her over to product um, as an example. So um, it's kind of a combination of telling them to speak up, but then also identifying talent and just throwing people into a new opportunity and seeing, you know, what they think of it and if they can be successful. How often do you get that call? It's like, hey, Liz, I'm bored. I just actually had a call like that with one of my team members <laughs> the other day. And I, um, he was, he was raising his hand for another job and I asked him, I said, Hey, you know, this is a parallel move. Like what's going on? And he's like, honestly, like, this is just, not, I'm just, I'm just, I've been doing the same thing for three years. It's like, okay, well then let's, let's have a conversation. And, and nine times out of 10, I'm able to, you know, shuffle work around and, and put that person on something that's more exciting to them, um, and, and retain and solve that that way. So, so do you see that a lot? Do you see people getting bored with the repetitive nature of the work? Not with our company so much. There's always, you know, a, a million different projects and um, uh, investments that we're making in the tech space that there's always something new to work on. I think where I see it is, I feel like around that two year mark when someone's in a role, they start to get an itch if it's the same thing that they're doing every day. And I feel like that's the part where you have to be kind of most cognizant about what's going on. Um, even when we do like engagement surveys across the company, right? I can typically see where there's a red spot in my engagement and it's someone that's been in their role for about two or three years that has a kind of a growth acumen. So so yeah, I do actually see that around that time frame, but I'm usually able to give them something more exciting without even having to do a job change or you know a new role or move to a different department sometimes. Um, just changing up their day-to-day -day monotony I find, you know, helps increase that retention and engagement with them. I want to talk a little bit about the product and technology. Yeah. So you said you know, you're always trying to make the digital experience for the customer better, but like, who is the customer? Is it physicians? Are it individuals that are logging in through portals to book meetings? Like what exactly do you guys build? Yeah, so for AM and healthcare, um, you know, we have two, two sides of customers, right? We have customers that are 
uh, clients are healthcare or health systems. Um, but then we also have customers that are healthcare professionals. So in this context, when I'm talking about the digital experience, I'm talking about our healthcare professionals, which can, you know, range from a physician to an allied professional, like an occupational therapist, speech language pathologist to, you know, nurses. So that whole spectrum of healthcare professionals is, is really our target of who we're trying to create a better experience for when it comes to, you know, workforce management and finding a job. Okay. So that's, that's the general idea of AMN Healthcare to help find, place these individuals? Yeah. I mean, holistically, we're a workforce technology company um, mm-hmm. that also has a staffing component. So we have the people kind of curation and engagement component, mm-hmm. but then we also provide clients with workforce technology solutions to help them optimize their workforce, whether it be contingent, permanent, per diem, et cetera. So um, things like vendor management solutions, um, things like AMM Passport, which is our self-service app for our clinicians, um, scheduling solutions, et cetera. So, so, you know, just helping them manage the workforce so that they can focus on, you know, the patient care and the outcomes is really kind of our value proposition when it comes to working with our clients. Okay. So I'll give you some background on me. So my brother is a family doctor. And okay. so so he's down in Florida and he's got patients that range from small children all the way up to the <laughs> elderly. And uh, then my uh, stepmom is, uh, she owns a clinic. They have about 10 doctors. They're, they're more like a specialty cash pay, uh, live your, you know, best peak of health type situation. Um and, and they have a staff, I think about like 40. Uh, either of those two companies, would either of those two individuals be using your software? So if your, um, if your, would you say your stepmom has a clinic? Yeah, yeah. Um, so if she has a clinic, a smaller clinic, that would typically be someone that's maybe working with uh, our per diem division, for example, if they just need help covering shifts because it's such a small staff. So they might work mm. with us to go ahead and, you know, fill holes um, in their schedule. If it was a, you know, maybe she had three or four different clinics, she might be using one of our vendor management technologies where she's saying, Mm. hey, I have workforce needs all the time and all I'm I'm gonna do is just enter them in this technology and AMN your systems and your people are gonna disperse them out to the right talent pools, get people interested and get them back to me. And I'll approve them and say that they can work here Um, But it's kind of that easy for her to say, here's an order, get it filled, let me distribute it out. Um, On the physician side, uh, the physician side is where we um, kind of partner from a locum tenens perspective or a permanent staffing perspective. So locum tenens is like per diem for physicians. And there's a lot of scheduling and complexity when it comes to that side of the house. So they might be interacting with us for a scheduling solution. Um, they might also use a vendor management solution, uh, but then also we'll, you know, staff and connect them with with physicians that can come in and fill in if your uh, family member ever wants to take a vacation and needs coverage. Yeah. So those would be some use cases there. Awesome. Do you mostly, so do you work with like the larger, like eight, I'm in Nashville, right? The largest industry right. here. People think it's music. It's not. It's healthcare. Uh, yeah. HCA is a behemoth that that's based in Nashville. Would you work with like their hospital systems or do those types of companies have their own tools? How does that work? Yeah, it, it depends, you know, uh, across the gamut, uh, various health systems have either exclusive partnerships with, um, a staffing company or they have technology that they're using to distribute. So it, it depends. Um, we have our own proprietary VMS that is embedded into a lot of health systems nationwide. But there are also other vendor management technologies out there that will work through like a field glass, for example, um, that may be embedded in a health system already. So we can integrate um, to existing technologies or a health system can implement our technology to support them um, with their staffing needs. That's awesome. Thanks for helping. Thanks for helping me just like try to wrap because I have this, you know, somewhat close experience because they're my family. And so I see it happening and I understand like some things, but also I spent a year traveling with my family. I've got a family, wife, three kids. We spent a year in an RV doing a one year camping trip around the United States. I met so many travel nurses and found out about like how that works. They'll go on these 
apps and the apps will dispatch them and they'll go do two months here or six weeks there and then they'll be in different cities. So there's a lot of travel nurses in the RV parks because a lot of them buy the RVs and travel around and do this. And so I was just trying to connect those dots for myself. Yeah, I mean, that's that's definitely like our core audience on the kind of healthcare professional candidate facing side is exactly that. And like, uh-huh. that's where creating this seamless digital experience for them is so important because, you know, you and I are, are sitting at a desk, you know, I don't know where you are, but we're sitting at a desk right now. And, you know, for my corporate job, sometimes I can work from home. Sometimes I'm in the office, but it's consistent, right? And these nurses are so brave. You know, they're packing up every 13 weeks. They're Mm -hmm. finding a new RV park. They're finding an Airbnb to stay in. They're calling their friends. They're going into completely different hospitals with different procedures and different EMR systems and different time entry systems. And that's a lot. Like changing a job one time every couple of years is a lot. But doing that every 13 weeks and learning all those new things puts a lot of pressure on those clinicians. So my goal and AMN's goal is to try to create everything around that abnormality every 13 weeks with something that feels very normal and very seamless for them as it relates to, you know, interacting with an app, finding jobs, talking to your recruiter, getting paid, learning about mm-hmm. the next opportunity. So, um, I mean, that's really our target audience is your, you know, your fellow RV park, uh, yeah. RV parkers. Yeah. We were working with this company. I can't remember their name. They're a, a medical company like you guys. And they had this, uh, they came. So we do our show, like we do my show, but we make like 20 other shows for enterprises, right? It's like Microsoft or whatever. They'll come to us and say, hey, we want a show. And so this this medical company came to us and they're like, hey, we want to do a show for travel nurses so that they can listen to it while they're traveling around a podcast and it'll help us with recruiting because they had like a big recruiting Right. goal thing. I don't know if you guys actually recruit or if you just do software. We do. Yeah, but, we, we, we have a oh, yeah, huge recruitment. Yeah. Okay. So we went through this whole like creative strategy session. We came up with this brilliant idea for this travel nurse podcast things that travel nurses would listen to. That way they would own their their audience and everything and, and be able to create this interesting, funny content about, you know, get these nurses hosting it, right? Fun. When we were doing research for it. We were looking in like Reddits and stuff to see what these nurses are talking right. about. They are hilarious. They yeah. are hilarious people. <laughs> they, yes, they, they're, they're, yes, I totally, I totally agree. We get, um, you know, we've got a couple of like TikTok channels and we actually have, oh, nice. Some, we have like a, a user generated content feature on our app where we give prompts and they like do a little snippet of like their response to the prompt and they share it with each other. And you get some, some just, just, their experience are so different than most people because of what they're doing. And they just have some great stories to tell. So they're, they're a really good group of people. Yeah. I found, you know, I, about, I think three years ago, I ran into this person that recommended that I I was sharing this, this brief story about how, when I met a bunch of people, like as I, I've done 700 something of these interviews, but after around two or 300, I started to understand people in a different way. And not everybody has that experience. And someone actually wrote a book called Meet 100 People. You've done this clearly through your networking and and all of that. But how you understand people grows as you meet and interact in a meaningful way with more people, not just like at the checkout line or something of that nature. But as, as um, as we're talking about this, I'm thinking like, okay, this... Uh, makes complete and total sense, this idea of, of meeting a bunch of people. And I was curious from, from your perspective, have you, have you met a hundred plus people and would you recommend it as far as like a, a helpful skill to grow your career and in interacting with individuals? I feel like I could say I've definitely met a hundred people. And I, I, I do think it's important. You know, it's interesting, like I'm, I'm very extroverted by nature, but networking is something that's always been uncomfortable to me. Like networking in the sense of you go to a network event, right? Um, And it's something that I've had to almost force myself to get used to. But I think, you know, it's less about meeting someone and immediately talking to them about like, here's my resume. I'm awesome. Like, let's connect on LinkedIn. And like, maybe we can help each other find jobs one day. I think it's less about that. I think it's more about, you know, just genuine connections and and talking to people. Like I've met some amazing people by just, you know, sitting at myself at a bar and talking to the person next to me and finding out what they do and just, you know, learning about them, who they are, or even, you know, 
going on a walk. You know, I'm always someone that like waves or says hi to people. I know it doesn't make everyone super uncomfortable. I think I got that from my dad. He, My dad used to be the guy that would run a marathon. And like, if you ran next to him, he would talk to you until you started either to run faster and get away from him or to stop and start walking because he just wanted to learn more about people. And I, and I feel like he really pushed that down onto me where I just want to get to know people that I meet and I enjoy striking up a conversation with about anyone. Yeah, you could ask my cousin, my, my cousin, my husband uh, about that. He, he loves it. But <laughs> I'm a bit of a workaholic, but also that kind of goes into, you know, pushing yourself and continuing to move forward. So well, you're in good company. I describe myself as a family first workaholic, right? I, that's I, a good I, description. I, I like that. Yeah, because I have I have a wife and three kids, and the kids, you know, you have to pay attention to them, <laughs> right? So it's like that is, and here's another thing I found too, as as far as growing and, and leading people, and with myself having kids and and going through that stage is that when things are right at home, whether you, it's just your kids or your relationship, whatever your home life looks like socially, when things are good there, work works so much better. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. So I'm always, I find myself often when people are, you know, performance issues or whatever it is, first trying to figure out like, hey, how's life going? Because <laughs> you're a top performer and things, uh, you're, you're not performing top right now. And I want to know like what's going on. Um, do you ever have to do any of that? Do you have any tips for me there? Yeah, I, it's, um, I don't remember what podcast I listened to this on, but someone made a comment of that, you know, they were trying to kind of continue to grow in their career and, and were working so hard, but realized that they were working so hard at avoiding dealing with their life and their life situations. And were almost like masking the masking the work and the reason they had to work with, I want to keep moving up, but really were avoiding kind of dealing with, with their life and what's going on. And I feel like, you know, we as, you know, professionals need to just almost gut check yourself every once in a while of like, okay, do I really need to be, you know, checking emails till 10 o'clock at night? Can I take a break and go have dinner with my husband? Can I go, you know, meet friends for happy hour? Like, I, I just think, sometimes you get so mired up in the work that you don't really realize why you're doing it or if you're actually running away from something or running towards something. And I, I thought that that was a really interesting nugget that I've taken with me to just check yourself and make sure you're not just avoiding something else by doing that. So you're an executive in this space. Are you going around and speaking at conferences or writing or doing anything publicly? Well, not as much as I probably should be, but um, you know, I'm, I'm really honestly focused most of my day on on building a product that our healthcare professionals will love. Um, and I spend a lot of time talking to our healthcare professionals, um, working on working with my teams and motivating them to learn new, interesting capabilities we can bring to them. So, um, you know, there's been a lot of changes in the healthcare market since COVID, right? So this year really has been a year of us kind of redefining and accelerating our experiences so that we can create something that has a good amount of stickiness so that clinicians, you know, want to work with AMN um, and have, you know, a full kind of breadth of opportunities. So uh, a lot more internal focus this year, uh, but as we continue to grow the product and get it out there, we'll definitely start to to talk about it more, uh, more publicly. How, how do you build a product that people love? I mean, you have to first start with the person that you want to use it. So um, when we actually first uh, built our app, uh, we were one of the first kind of healthcare staffing recruitment apps out there in this space a couple of years ago. Now it's pretty heavily saturated, which is a whole nother, you know, challenge to, to face. But um, we actually, you know, a lot of product teams, most product teams hopefully do design thinking, right? And a lot of that is internal and, you know, you get your corporate people together and you do a design thinking session, you come up with problems you want to solve. Um, we actually did that with clinicians when we started out and really talked to them about like, hey, what are what are the pain points you deal with every day, searching for jobs, trying to be a healthcare professional, doing credentialing, doing time entry. And we built our roadmap based on their feedback. And then we have consistently for multiple years done like monthly voice of customer programs where we're either getting feedback on existing capabilities or our roadmap for the next year. Um, so that clinician feedback is our number one priority. Like making sure that that is aligned is, is the most important thing. And I think that's why our app's been successful. I mean, we have 
you know, one of the highest app store ratings out there and with the most reviews and clinicians love our app. And, you know, that leads to better business for AMN. And, and you know, it's a win-win across the board um, for us and for the healthcare professionals. Do you just get, is it mostly staffing and vendor management or do you get into like the EMR stuff? We we don't do like EMR implementations or manage sort of any any sort of like EMRs, but we do interact with EMRs when it comes to like integrating with data. So whether we're leveraging EMR data to help with um, predictive analytics or predictive scheduling based on, you know, procedures we're seeing, things like that. So it's more about leveraging the data for, you know, predictive mm-hmm. workforce needs, um, but less about the EMR technology itself from a, you know, AMN scope perspective. Interesting. I, I hope that industry consolidates and creates better products and, and then makes it easier. Yeah. That's one of the pain points for our clinicians, right? Like, I mean, just imagine you showed up to work every day and you've got a different EMR system and you've got a different, you know, you have Kronos time entry, which most folks have, but, you know, you have to enter time this way here and this way here. And you've got a different, you know, way to access drugs in the pharmacy and you have a different code and a different, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's not like we have, you know, our Office 365 apps or if you use the Google suite, right, where it's on your laptop and your phone and anywhere you go, it's the same. Like, it's just totally different for these clinicians. They're not, they're not in their day-to-day life. They're just not experiencing something seamless. And that's what we have to do as their employer um, on the flip side, make everything else seamless for them. Oh yeah. When I, <laughs> my brother's office and he's like, yeah, so we like VPN into this thing. And then there's this like app on like the windows that we VPN. And I was like, man, I thought they stopped doing this like in the nineties. I was like, why, yeah. <laughs> where, where's like the cloud software you can connect to from anywhere? He's like, oh, they, they don't do it like that in this, in yeah. this space. I was like, yeah. oh, all right. Yeah, I get it. There's, there's all sorts of stuff in the military and then in the medical field and, and it takes time, but Thankfully, we, thankfully we have great people like you who you get to use this types of, you know, technology in your day-to-day life, right? And you you understand the ease of it and the use of it and then you get to go build technologies to get us one step closer to that in our work lives as well. Yeah, yeah, I I, I totally agree and I think I think sometimes um, you know, when 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 you're building a new product, you get so mired into like, okay, what is my singular business outcome I'm trying to drive with it? And I think with something like an app right? Because that's, you know, primary thing that my team works on. There's a million of them out there. Everyone offloads their apps that they don't use, you know, after 30 days automatically on most phones, right? So you think about what's important to them in like the healthcare professional interaction, but then you also have to think about all the other apps they're using day to day and try to find like parallel experiences. So Mm. it might not feel related whatsoever, but like, you know, how often do people buy a house? I don't know, once every 10 years, right? But how often are people interacting with a Zillow or a Redfin app? Actually, monthly, if not weekly. And so, you know, in your initial intention, you could say, oh, I'm going to build an app to help people buy houses, right? Okay, great. You could make something transactional that has an easy way to do a mortgage application and to, you know, do your signatures and you're done. Or you could think about it in a way where, no, I'm actually going to be this app that is a point of conversation and spikes curiosity when I'm driving through a new city and I'm like, oh, how much would it cost to live here? Or, oh, that's a cool place. Like, let me go see the inside of it. And, you know, Zillow went from, okay, you know, uh, it could have been an app where you just did a mortgage application to something that you're engaging with day to day just because it's interesting to you. But then when you actually do want to buy a house, your Zillow app is on your phone because you're using it all the time and they get that transaction. And I think what we're trying to do in our space is like change the paradigm to not just be about yeah, we're an app that like, if you want to be a travel nurse, you can, you know, get a job and move forward. You know, I want us to be this kind of talent network for healthcare professionals where we are available to them at any kind of career arc. So, you know, maybe that same person in the future is looking at, oh, how much does a condo here cost? But like, oh, I'm curious, like, do they have shifts here I could pick up if I wanted to like stay here for a couple of weeks and then come to our app and look at a per diem shift where they could say, well, I'm curious, like what the salary of a perm nurse is over here, like, and they could see perm jobs or they could see, you know, what types of hospitals are in this area. And I, and I, I want us to start thinking about that experience in a more fluid way with other type like experiences. Um, Cause then we just get a really engaged network. And then at the end of the day, we've got this great pool that our clients can access in a flexible way that ultimately gets them the outcomes they want as well. No, I love it. I, 
I get excited when I meet cool people like you. Uh, you mentioned that, um, I don't want to forget, I was trying to, you mentioned something very specifically earlier about your team learning new capabilities, right? Uh, can you expand, like, how do you help your team learn new capabilities so that ultimately you get a better product? Couple different ways. I can I can give you something more tactical, which it's like n- people don't have to copy this. I'm not saying it's a, a silver bullet with, whatsoever, but um, you know, for my team will tell you this. But you know, I make it a point where we have a full everyone's together once a week for the same hour, and we've done it since I've run this team for the last couple of years. And every week, someone else actually hosts the huddle. They're totally responsible for it. I never talk half the time. Well, they'll tell you I talk because I ask questions, but I'm never hosting it. Um, But what they have to do is every host has to, for the first 15 minutes, pick a new topic that they're going to teach everyone else about. So we like force each other to learn something. So they'll pick a topic in technology and they'll, they'll teach, you know, they'll teach the broader group about it. So sometimes it might be a capability on one of our platforms. Like the other week, someone presented on Um, one of our uh, CDP or like omni-channel platforms actually has uh, some embedded AI where conversational AI where um, based on the demographic of the person that we're talking to, we can change the tone to be like, talk to them like a Gen Z or talk to them like a Gen X. And it just changes, you know, the entire messaging and uses like nomenclature that's more, you know, applicable to whatever generation. So, um, and that's just a little nugget. And it got everyone thinking about, okay, how can I use that in digital marketing? How can I use that here? So, um, w- that's, so we teach each other. Um, and that's something that we've just held, held consistent. So that's one piece. And then, you know, the traditional, like we've got podcasts we share, we have Gartner licenses. Um, we're constantly doing kind of competitive and indirect and non-direct research and just trying to stay up on trends. But, um, that first one is just a, it's a routine that you get in and the team wants to learn something new every week. Bring it, break it down a little bit more tactically. So you you run this, you find the different hosts that that do this. Uh, and you see, you just have like a weekly meeting, and then the work on your side is they understand the format because they they're a part of it, and then you just find a different person to host it each week. So we every year we reset like how we're going to run it. But so this is how we're running it this year. But literally in December last year, we create a calendar for the entire year of who's hosting every week, and um based on our engagement survey scores, we, and what feedback is, we'll adjust what's in the meeting. Um, so this year was all about learning something new. So the, the host does literally the particular PowerPoint. Sometimes it's a video. Sometimes it's something more interactive for the first 15 minutes. And then we just do round robin updates. So we've got, you know, a running live notebook where everyone just talks about like, what's one thing you accomplished this week? What's something, what's a risk that you want to bring up? Um, and then what's your primary focus for the week? So each kind of department goes around. And then the last 15 minutes, that host spends reintroducing the next host. So what we love about it is because, you know, we're a big team and we're spread out. It kind of forces people to re-get to know someone. So, you know, maybe Joel, I met you one time in a meeting for 15 minutes and I haven't talked to you for six months. I'm going to interview you about your family and your favorite place to travel and every kind of host comes up with a fun way to introduce them. So, you know, I had one of my guys do a video that was like a mock on the between two ferns and literally did an interview (laughs) of the person. And we had another guy that did like a, what's the game where you flip all the people over? Guess who? Is that what it is? Yeah. Yeah, We did like a guess who to figure out who the person was. So people just get really creative and it's just a fun way to still, you know, garner engagement in sort of a hybrid virtual world, but then also learn something new and, you know, give updates and make sure we all know what each other are working on so we can have each other's back if, you know, someone's not in a meeting or, or missing out on a, on an initiative. That is awesome. It sounds like you guys have a lot of fun over there. We do. I I really, I I love my team. I, I can't speak more highly of them. It's a, it's a great group of people. Well, this is a great point for a call to action. If people, technologists out there are interested in joining your team, we've got people that design, technology, product, the whole spectrum listen to the show. Are you hiring currently? And if so, where should they go to learn more? Yeah, at amnhealthcare.com slash careers. Um, always have our different, you know, opportunities on there. And, you know, feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn. Um, you know, it's not a a, a, a fake call to action. Like, please, I'm, you know, message me, send me something that you're interested in. We're 
Um, always looking at contractors, too, for some projects that we're standing up. So um, always have opportunity to think about, you know, ways to get involved with AMN and some of our technology products. That's amazing. How are you guys currently using? I mean, like the chat GPT thing exploded earlier this year. It's on yeah. everybody's radar. Have yeah. you implemented anything in any production stuff? Or are you running any experiments currently with it? Yeah, so we are, um, we have launched actually quite a, a, quite a few things into production. And I think um, they're, they're the less fun things. I mean, we, we do have some fun things around like, you know, conversational AI and chatbots. And we've got, you know, job matches where they take preferences from clinicians and we send you jobs that, you know, you would like based on your preferences or maybe future preferences. But I think one of the um, more like nerdy healthcare things that we've been doing are around credentialing. So, you know, I think the things that that's you know, we keep talking about all these different things a clinician has to do to start an assignment. Um, and one of the things they have to do is actually get credentialed at every single hospital they go work at. So um, similar to your, you know, family member, if he went to work at a different hospital, he'd have to get privileged there to work, um, which basically every time as a verification of all your nursing licenses, you do, uh, you know, a, a drug screen, you get a TB test, you prove all your vaccinations, you show all your case logs. And it's a very, very manual, very, you know, costly expense for clients and for AMN, and then also just really painful for clinicians. It's literally like doing a mortgage application every 13 weeks. So what we've been trying to do is leverage AI to better read documents and read index and then actually verify documents. So anything from like identity verification to um, licensure to, you know, creating something that will read a vaccine card with any doctor's handwritten scribble on it and say, yes, this is what it is. And you have, you know, these two vaccines and you're good to go to really just try to make it easier for the clinician and then reduce the overhead on our side to have to manually go through that. So that's, you know, less sexy because it's, you know, document verification, but it actually has been a really useful tool for us to create efficiencies across the board for clients, clinicians, and AMN internal. That sounds like a huge cost savings. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, and it, it has a lot of other utilizations. I mean, if you wouldn't believe this, but people still, you know, do handwritten time cards if they're picking up a shift. So, you mm. know, maybe we don't have to have someone interpret that anymore. We can just leverage um, different technology to to read the time card and pump it into a system versus someone keying it in and, you know, reducing some of those errors too. So lots of opportunity where there's a lot of still handwriting happening in the the medical space that uh, you maybe think was solved by every EMR out there. But um, there's still a lot of that that helps us, you know, just be more efficient. Is there anything that you're excited about that's that's coming soon that you can talk about? Yeah. Um, well, I can talk about something we just actually launched, um, which I do think is going to be a big differentiator in the market um, right now. I think, you know, you'll hear uh, staffing companies talk about like a gig economy, right? And they'll have these apps where nurses, they'll say it's like the Uber and, you know, a nurse can just pick up a shift whenever they want to. Um, but that's usually kind of a standalone thing. And then you'll have travel nursing apps and then you'll have your, you know, LinkedIn for your permanent career, et cetera. So we actually just launched um, a pilot here recently where we've integrated all those different job types into one experience. So someone can pick up shifts very easily at the same time, you know, when they're working a travel assignment or look at perm jobs. And I think that's going to be one of our differentiators because we will kind of officially be that life cycle management solution and, you know, really start to expand the possibilities for these clinicians that are looking for more flexible opportunities to 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 see them all and find them all in one space. So I'm I'm super excited about that. It's just a small pilot to start out with, um, but we're quickly expanding um, to additional clients here. Oh, nice! So like you're aggregating these opportunities. Yeah, we well we use our VMS right. So so basically think about like we've got this large technology where you know clients enter their orders, and we want to connect it to our talent network. So that there's a kind of that direct connection between what our clients are asking for and what our clinicians can see. And when it comes to picking up shifts, that's the most tedious manual process there is. It's a nurse manager sending an email to someone who puts it in technology who then calls three nurses to say, can you pick up this shift? So now we've kind of integrated the VMS with the talent network on Passport 
where those shifts just get directly to people that are matched to them. They get alerted. They can pick them up up to four hours before a shift actually starts um, and show up and work it. So efficient for the hospitals and, you know, additional work for the clinicians, um, you know, where they want it. I saw this happening seven years ago or so in the restaurant industry. So I saw that the way, I, I don't know where I was, I was at a restaurant, but the way I heard the staff talking about work was less of, I work at Outback or Chili's or Applebee's and more of, I've got three shifts at Outback, two at Chili's, four at Applebee's in the next you know week or two. And for me, that's, that just piqued my interest. So I started, I walked over to them and I started talking to them. I was like, hey, explain this to me. My parents did own a restaurant growing up when I was a kid. So I, was, I had some interest. I was like, explain this to me. Like, how does this work? And they're like, yeah, there's this app. And like, I put my availability. And so they, they were doing this in the restaurant industry, um, or I at least started seeing them do that a few years ago. Have you seen that at all in the restaurant industry or no? I haven't actually heard of it, but I'm wondering mm. if it's, you know, it, that that is... You know, if I think about that, I'd be curious if the restaurants are doing it where each of those restaurants act as the individual employer or if there's some sort of employer on the back end that's actually like a third party staffing agency that's putting them there. I'm going to look it up after this. I'm going to go look it up because it's a great parallel use case. So I'm going to educate myself after this on that. Yeah, I, I have. I can't tell you. I don't know. I just heard them talking about it and that caused me like some interest. Uh, and, I, and apparently I was like, well, how do you handle like knowing the menu? Like, well, you have to like work that you have to be like approved and like on their list and like right. have gone through the training and then, and then they just post the shifts and you can pick them up because if, if everybody is like posting their shifts individually and there's just one platform that they happen to all be using because they're using the same POS management platform, mm-hmm. then from the from the perspective of the employee, they can just pick and pick and choose across uh, what they want to do, which I which I think is really interesting that it went that way. Yeah, I mean it's it's a great parallel. I mean that, that's our goal for our clinicians, right? Is is the value prop to them is it's a one stop shop, and then the value prop to the client is that you access this network. Um, it's all just about you know back to kind of the AI example of like, well, how fast can we get you credentialed at all these places? Right. Because because, you know, similar to what you said with like Applebee's, right? Well, you got to go through orientation. You got to know the menu. You got to know the P- the POS. Like you have to know all that before you can work here. Hospitals are the same way. You have to have your orientation. You got to be credentialed. You got to know all of that. So we have to build that pool so that more people can start to grab those shifts um, at the same time. So um, lots of work to be done on the healthcare side. I think there's a lot more barriers to entries to have like a full kind of true gig economy. But this this um, balance between flexible multiple types of work, I think, is where we'll end up landing. Where a clinician might be perm full time and is on, you know, working four days a week, but picks up an extra shift on a Saturday because you know they have nothing to do. They want to make some extra money, um, or they're on a travel assignment. And in between their two travel assignments, they just want to go to a new city for a couple weeks and pick up some shifts and make some money while they're doing that. Um, so I see it being this kind of blended experience that um, creates flexibility that people are looking for um, in their work-life balance. That's awesome. What is the most the the thing in your personal life that you're most excited about right now? Oh, that is a great question. What am I most excited about in my personal life? See, I did the thing where I've been talking about work the whole time. Well, actually, we talked about some well, this, other is, this is the but, point. We're at work now, right now. now We're at now, work. Yeah, I know, right? Um, most excited about well i love the holidays so i mean we're we're super close but um you know my my husband's uh dad is like a professional santa so christmas starts for us uh right around thanksgiving oh yeah he's an amazing santa so uh we actually you know we dressed as like buddy the elf and jovi (laughs) in a in in a parade last year yeah we were on a float behind him and his mom is Mrs. Claus. And that was super fun. And then my family is just huge and we have such a fun time. Like we do a champagne walk, turkey trot around our neighborhood where all the neighbors nice. come out and it takes us like four hours to do a one mile walk. Um, but it's just, I, I just love the holidays. I love my family so much. So um, I am excited about that. Me too. So here's the most important question of the entire interview. Can you watch Christmas movies before Thanksgiving? I think you can appropriately watch Christmas movies before Thanksgiving if it's cold outside. And I know that's a really oh. weird answer, 
But if it's like, if the atmosphere is giving you the vibe of like cozy Christmas, then I'm okay. fine with it. All right. Are you but in you full know what? I won't judge right anyone. <laughs> I don't, uh, Texas is a weird place, man. It, it's like, you know, it's been over 100 for four months and then all of a sudden it's like 50 degrees. And so I've started to get cozy, but I'm also, I know it could spike back up to 100 like next week and we're not going to know what's happening. So, you know, I just try to keep it kind of, Keep it level headed until we officially yeah. like move to winter out here. And this is this has been absolutely fantastic, Liz. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it.